make sure they come through. Can they hear me? Eartha. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, we, we wish to start in a few. As a matter of fact, I think we can start now. Our room is filling up nicely and we want to, we want to be on time. So welcome, Dr. Ennis. I see Dr. Ennis. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome all. Uh, could, we, could we start, Eartha?
things are just never said, no. I am history. Take a look inside, see the great things that people do. Changing life, I am a bright. Nothing I do ever makes the news. Still, I have to do what's right to the king of all kings. All praises. I am natural. I was on a train. A little boy asked me my name. He said, Sir, I've seen you before. Tell me. I'm empowered. Said, I am a legend. That you never heard of before. I said I am a lion. I, I am in your memory. I am a hero that nobody saw. But he remembers my name. That means I made a change. Thank you, family and friends, well-wishers, colleagues, welcome. Uh, without further ado, let me ask our executive director, Mr. Crawford, Mr. Vivian Crawford, to offer words of welcome. Nobody does it better than Mr. Crawford, so welcome, sir. Thank you, Mrs. Newell, for your very generous introduction. I suppose this is in lieu of a virtual lunch. <laughs> Thank you. Madam moderator, Mrs. Dan Newell, members of the Council of the Institute of Jamaica, including Professor Dennis Eldemashera, Dr. Melody Ennis, Director of Family Health Unit at the Ministry of Health and Wellness, our guest speaker, members of the board of the Natural History Museum of Jamaica, staff of the Institute of Jamaica, including Mrs. Tracy Comock, who is the director for the Natural History Museum of Jamaica, guests, members of the public on virtual link, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Institute of Jamaica, it is my privilege, pleasure and duty to welcome you all to this presentation by Dr. Melody Ennis, concerning COVID-19. We are grateful, Dr. Ennis, that you have decided to share your expertise with us. And what is on the agenda for us today is, it is to be, not to be. 
to be or not to be. It is to be, not to be. And it is fortuitous that you are at a space near where Mary C. Cole, perhaps Jamaica's most outstanding nurse, was born, and also a space where British Admiral Lord Nelson visited while he was recuperating in Jamaica. Dr. Ennis, we welcome you. And we put our hands together as we say, welcome to Dr. Ennis. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Crawford. We want to shout out our friends and colleagues on the YouTube platform. We welcome everyone. As Mr. Crawford said, we're happy to have you join us. And so without further ado, we have a poll that we want to, to do immediately. And that will be followed by Elizabeth Morrison and Mr. Kervin Santoki who will talk to us, they will share with us their experiences with the COVID-19 illness. They were uh, sick a couple of months ago and thankfully, thanks be to God, they are with us and they will share their experiences. So we, after the poll, I will invite Liz, who is also our coworker, and we will invite her to share with us her experiences. So let us, let us do the poll very quickly. So ladies and gentlemen, it runs very fast, so I'll ask that you enter your information as soon as possible. We have one minute, so we will ask our able assistant, Eartha, to post the poll before we begin. Excellent. All right, excellent. So Emma Lewis says she's done. Anybody else? Are we ready? Easy stuff, easy stuff. So in a little while, Kareen Parks is done. Very good, Kareen. So let's see, we will post the results in a Oh, great. Good job, Mr. Crawford. A no, plus for you, sir. Portland is called J-A-B. It means work. Oh, job. That's right, sir, job. <laughs> ah, so here we have, well, only 8% said they don't intend to take the vaccine, 15%. Uh, uh, have taken it already, have been vaccinated already, and 38% are either not sure and or some 38% said yes. So not bad so far. We hope that with our presentations this afternoon, we will see 0% no. We look forward to that. So thank you everyone for participating in this. And it's, it's heartening to see that 38% of us have been vaccinated so far. So that's wonderful. All right, so I will now invite Elizabeth, my friend and colleague who had me uh, on pins and needles a few months ago, but thanks be to God, she's with us and she's going to be sharing her experiences. So ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome Liz. Uh, thank you very much. I hope everyone is here and I'm so pleased to be here. And pleased to be talking um, with you all about, about my experience with COVID and uh, my hospitalization. Um, so I've gotten a lot of um, questions. People have been um, understandably curious because, you know, some people have said, well, they don't, they've never met anyone who had COVID. <laughs> and, um, you know, you know, um, you know, I'm just glad that, I, you know, I can say, listen, I've had it and I'm, I'm on the mend. Um, in March, I, you know, I for a year, knowing that I had the comorbidities, I, I stayed home as much as possible. 
and uh, work from home, uh, you know, avoiding crowded places, wear my mask, did my sanitization, everything. But the fact of the matter is, you know, the, the, the life has to go on. You have to meet, you know, somebody has to go out and do all of those things that you need to do. So um, my family member, you know, he took the, the boat, the, 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 you know, was doing the bulk of all the shopping, going to market, going to stuff. So he came home, um, <clears throat> lots of, sort of feeling run down. Wouldn't, you know, nothing, you know, I said, this has been working hard. You know, you look a little tired, just stay in and rest. You know, they didn't realize that, you know, that was the beginning of COVID in the house. <laughs> so um, even, you know, that very day when he wasn't feeling that well, um, you know, I went out to work. I, you know, had about interactions with about 10 or so of my colleagues, two of them in close quarters for a good while. So when it was confirmed that he did have COVID, I was so, you know, so afraid. I was mortified that I had, you know, come in contact with, 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 with staff members. I was worried that boy, you know, they're going to carry it home to their, their family and friends. Um, you know, we tried to get, um, to get confirmation definitely whether or not I had it. But by that, that time, I was already experiencing symptoms. Um, the, the worst of which was a, was a horrendous headache behind the eyes. Um, you know, you, you could barely, I could, was very, very photosensitive. And, um, you know, I had lost um, appetite. You know, I had a cough, but, uh, you know, I would say it was a severe cough, but very, um, not regular. Um, but every once in a while, a very sharp cough. That was unusual. And um, also, you know, as the days progressed, the cough, you know, kept coming back worse and worse. Um, progressed to vomiting, um, diarrhea. I had a little rash that only, you know, when you bathe, you felt it. Um, but the, the worst thing is that you were, you know, the, the fatigue. Um, so in the night, I wasn't really able to, to sleep. One of my friends came and um and with a with a with an oximeter. So I I was taking my oxygen readings, but I wasn't really sure how to interpret them. I I, I hear I wasn't doing it well. <laughs> so I thought that if um you had you you were 90 and above, you were good. <laughs> but apparently it's not it's if you go below um 96 the doctors are concerned and you're supposed to go to the hospital um but i was you know using you know saying oh well 90 that's an a so i'm okay <laughs> you know maybe you know doc, doc, um, dr eddie will talk about that but you know so my my oxygen readings were going low um when i moved it, it became difficult to move around i i you know was having um you know was very very tired and um, my doctor came to see me. Luckily, I, I, where I live, she could stay outside and, and, and I opened the window and she, she said, listen, you're not looking good. You're not getting better. You need to go to the hospital. Um, I was initially resistant because, you know, you hear all oh, people go to the hospital and, you know, people are going to die in there. But the fact of the matter is, if you stay at home, you'll also die at home. <laughs> so, um, you know, by the next day, I was I was so tired. Um, you know, I, I was just sleeping or I couldn't um if I got up, I couldn't really move around. So um, you know, I was the, I was just happy at that point that there was a bed available that I could get into. Um, you know, so that somebody could look after me. Um, I was, you know, trying to drink ginger and ginger, the fever grass, I drank turmeric, I did all of all of that. But you know, it just for me it wasn't where it wasn't getting better. Um, and I was throwing up everything. So 
Uh, once I did reach the hospital, I was at KPH Ward 3B. Um, and in the in the, the, the care of um, Sister Antonia Stewart and her team, her PCAs, I have to say a very, 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 very grateful to them and the doctors. Um, they were stern, but they were they were loving. They came with the medicine on time. They came with the food on time. They came um, when you when you, I mean they couldn't come to answer every single call um, because you know the, the ward was full, it was absolutely full. You had to really know to 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 to, to look after yourself. You know, do what the, the nurses say. Um, try well I for one try to 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 help myself as much as possible because recognizing the situation we were in the second spike of um COVID and the, the doctors and nurses were there working very long hours. I saw nurses on their feet they were just running from bed to bed to bed. Um you know the, the pressure on the system was tremendous and um you know I made up my mind I would do everything that I could to 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 um I mean, the best thing that I could do was to take my medicines on time. You know, I, I was so weak. You know, I could only walk up and down or bathe or, you know, myself. Um, used to, to, to lie. We can't lie down on our back. We're advised to lie on our stomachs in a certain position so that you can, um, so the lungs can heal and drain. Um, what apparently was happening is that my lungs were so fried you know, so uh, inflamed that um, I, I couldn't exchange gases properly. Um, I was on oxygen first on a, a rather tight mask. And then as I got better taking the medications, um, the, the mask de decreased in size until I was able to spend a night without the mask. That was very frightening for me because I wasn't sure if um, I would stop breathing. Um, the, in the, the, the area that we were, um, there were people who did come in, um, we saw, you know, persons who just didn't make it, um, they stopped breathing and, um, you know, it was, it was a very frightening experience. Um, some of the people just, they were speaking to their family and friends, similar to, I was speaking to my family and friends. And you know, you could say, well, listen, um, they're, they're, we are in the same boat, you know. Um, they're for the grace of God, go I. So, you know, I just want to say to my, my colleagues and friends um, who may have doubts, I've spoken to people even in the hospital, they said, you know, listen, they don't believe in COVID, they don't think it's, it's a real thing, they're not going to take the vaccine. Um, it is, I only have to say this and it is real. I, I did see people not win the battle. They, they died in the night. You, you, you know, I, I saw a lot of that. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm worried for this new variant that's coming. I don't think Jamaicans are really, are really prepared. Um, to do, and I mean, I would do anything that was necessary. To, to, to ensure that I did come out, you know. So there was a time when I would, all I could do was lie on the bed and, and look outside. And I said, the first thing that I would do when I came out was to, was to go somewhere and breathe, you know, <laughs> go, go to the, go somewhere fresh, get some fresh air. And I just wanted to make sure that I could, um, you know, walk somewhere again. And, um, the, my first step was to walk to the to the balcony that I could see from my bed with the permission of sister. <laughs> and um you 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 and to maintain a positive attitude. Um when I when I did get better and I was released, it, you know, one of the best things that that happened that I when I was there was that um I met um a friend, Mr. Santoki. We'll hear from him. Um, we kept each other, um, you know, we could talk across, you know, across the distance, make sure, you know, listen, are you having a good day? How, you know, are you doing your breathing exercises? Um, 
you 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 know how are you feeling and um you know encourage each other that we're gonna get out and we're gonna go back to our families and um we actually started in, in the hospital to say listen when we get out we're not gonna turn our back on on kph and you know on the other people who are having a struggle um you know and we we, we made our plans to to do our fundraising we set up our foundation together and he's gonna be speaking about that but um I, you know, I just like to, so, you know, that was, that was one of the, one of the good, good things that happened. Um, and also just now I have, you know, I'm not letting anything that's not necessary to bother me, but, you know, bother me now. I'm thinking, you know, about life and, um, you know, the, the good things that life has to offer and being grateful for, for every day. Um, that I'm out when I when I'm out now, you know, I've started yoga. <laughs> I started um, water aerobics. You know, I'm trying to build back my lung capacity to make sure, you know, that I, I um I mean my brain, I feel it's a little foggy, but maybe that's age, maybe that's <laughs> you know, maybe that was happening. <laughs> but um I'm so glad, you know, to you know, so glad, grateful to the KPH. Greater to sister, sister, and um, and and her team. It's not easy. It's the uh, this disease is very debilitating. When I heard from the doctor, when at the day I I came in, she said, "Listen, you may lose consciousness, and we may have to in intubate you. Who is your family member that will make the decision to keep you on life support or not?" And I was like, you know. <laughs> You know, I was, I, you know, it really came home, you know, several times you have to really think, you know, what, I, I, I didn't know what to say <laughs> at that point. Um, and I did see people have to be rushed to ICU to be intubated. Um, but there was one, there was one person maybe on the, the sixth day, on the sixth day, I saw somebody um, walk out. <laughs> he was, he was, you know, because I had, I've been there six, seven days. I hadn't seen anybody leave, you know. And the, on the sixth day, he got, you know, somebody walked out, and you know, I turned to, to Mr. Santoki and I said, "Listen, look there, <laughs> look there, Santoki. <laughs> that guy's coming out, and we're gonna come out too." So, you know, um, you know, if you do get it, just try it and, um, you know, keep keep a. a a positive attitude. So I, I'm not sure if my, my time is up. Um, you know, I just want to say, you know, I, I don't want to, to, you know, to force people to take the vaccine, but I really do feel it's the, the best action um, that you can do to protect yourself. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not a, a thing to, it, it is, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of, um, of this season, you you sleep in hospital. Um, some people don't recover fully. Um, so and some people don't re recover at all. You have to really. Um, so I, I when I was in there, I was in there for two weeks. I saw somebody in there die every day, and so I thought the numbers, you know, that was just too much. Um, some of the people I was speaking to them just a few minutes before we were trying to encourage each other sometimes you sleep in the night you wake up the bed is the, you look across you say where the person you know the, the porter came for them in the night so you know i can only warn you please um take care um i'm happy that i didn't infect anyone else um but it, you know, even when I wasn't sure if I had it, we maintained the six feet distance, um, you know, try to at work to not congregate um, or to, to, to make sure that, um, you know, if we are talking to each other, they stop at the door, you know, we stop six feet apart. We're always wearing our masks. 
washing hands and using sanitizers. So, and now please, when the vaccine becomes available, um, take it. That's what I have to say. Hi. Thanks, Liz. Liz, I, 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 I was a part of the process. I went through it with you uh, while you were in the hospital. It was very frightening. And Liz is my dearest friend. And I'm just so happy to have her with us here today to share her testimony. I'm not sure if we'll have the time, though, for Mr. Santoki to... Uh, talk to us about the foundation, but what he could do is to put that in the chat because we have an active chat going on. Thank you, everyone. Certainly on our Zoom platform, we have an active chat going on. So without further ado, I will continue on the program because time is against us and we want to, to, to stay on time with our activities. So thank you so much, Liz. And I will ask everyone to reserve their questions because I know many persons are bursting with questions. So I'll ask you to kind of hold those questions until we get to our question and answer session after Dr. Ennis makes her presentation to us. So Dr. Ennis, I will hand the floor over to you. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome Dr. Ennis. Uh, good. Afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity to share. I am going to ask if permission can be granted for me to share my screen. And as that is being done, I have but few disclaimers. I think it might just be one. And it really is to say that the treatment the management, the safety of everyone is a holistic affair. But I have been asked to speak on vaccines and therefore that is the focus. That does not in any way, shape or form negate the need for us to be eating properly, exercising, sleeping, getting adequate sunlight, having emotional, physical, and religious stability in our lives in order to be healthy. I am aware of all of those things, but my main focus will be on vaccines. I believe I may be able to share screen at this time. And as such, I will run right into the presentation. As I try to get it on slideshow, I want to thank Lady Liz for speaking. It was warming uh, on several notes, but of course, the most important one is that she's here with us and uh, able to share. Uh, thank you so very much. Very inspiring. So we are talking vaccines this afternoon. You know, am I to get the vaccine or not? Uh, and if not, why not? So we know exactly why we are here at this point of anguish. Because it's been over a year, we have been plagued with deaths, lockdown, separation, loneliness. And every time we think, yeah, we're getting a breather and we're coming out, there seems to be something that says, oh, no. The reins are still tight. And even if you have not been affected by COVID, persons really are in fear, very anxious, most depressed, and all of those things equal illness and being unwell. So medicine really and truly is not doing well. The scale is heavily tipped in the direction of anguish. And, you know, we have tried. Medicine have made an effort, uh, a darn good chance. You know, we have thrown antibiotics, we have thrown steroids, we have used antiretrovirals, we are now uh, grappling with ivermectin. So we have been using all the medications that we know to try and stem this pandemic. But 
what has happened. We are at 194 million persons being infected. We have over 50,000 here in country. We have 4.16 million persons that have died. And if we just pause one moment at this very important number, we will realize that it's more than Jamaica's population. So if COVID did only affect Jamaica, one, and no other country, there would be none of us here. We are but barely but getting up to 3 million. So it's that impact that this disease have had on us. And we are at the point, what next? And we have turned to vaccines. Now, why vaccines? Simply because it's the medicine that is tried and proven for infectious diseases for over 200 years. Vaccines have been rigorously tested and even after being placed on the market, vaccines continue to be monitored. You know, it's, it's kind of like unfair with vaccines because they have done so much, but because we give vaccines to healthy persons, we don't expect anything at all to go wrong because we're giving them to healthy persons to prevent them from getting ill. But if we really look at the global situation of vaccines, we recognize that you know, we get so much when our population is vaccinated. And for every US dollar that's invested in immunization, we yield about $44 in economic and social benefits. Now, I have been speaking, yeah, vaccines, but what have been really accomplished since we have started using vaccines over the last 120 plenty years? Well, it's the medication that has allowed for the eradication of a disease. So smallpox, we certainly don't know what that looks like. Uh, we might have read about the devastation that it would have caused. Uh, vaccines continue every single year to save up to 3 million lives. Again, population of Jamaica, that's the amount of persons that remain alive because they take vaccines. Now, measles, a deadly disease affecting children, and even if you don't die, you are left maybe blind, maybe deaf, uh, only exists in 12 countries. We have polio. Uh, again, not a lot of us, because of the successes of vaccines, we don't even know what this thing looks like. But if you go back in the archives, you will know about the iron lung. You will know the death toll of polio. We only have polio in three countries. And there are over 25 vaccines for vaccine preventable illnesses. Now, we've moved out of just infectious diseases with vaccines, and they're being used to treat cancers. For example, the human papilloma virus vaccine that is right here in Jamaica, that is used to prevent uh, cervical cancer. Now, of course, our history is, is very important. And we are a part of the Americas, the region of the Americas. And the Caribbean region, we have been uh, leaders in the acceptance of vaccines. Vaccines are not strange to us. We were the first region to eliminate smallpox, the first region to be certified polio free. You know, we were the first region to introduce the pneumococcal vaccine, the HPV vaccine, the rotavirus. We have been vaccinating our people in the Caribbean for a very long time, and we have always been leaders. So what are vaccines? Why do they work so well? And in the same breath, why are people resisting? And why are there so many anti-vaxxers? So vaccines are simply substances uh, or medicines, if you will, that we take via injection drops or nasal spray, and they stimulate our bodies to produce what we call antibodies. And antibodies are actually germ-fighting tools. These tools help us to produce a stronger and quicker immune response to invading organisms. So what is this immune response? It is simply our body's ability to do what? To fight off, resist, to withstand, to keep at bay. Any one of those words you want to use to not make it affect us. 
that is what our immune uh, system does. Now, we have specialized cells that once they have been sensitized or exposed, then they develop memory. And if ever a germ comes into us that they have been sensitized to, then they are ready to attack. So our immune system, I believe that the army or armies across the world have really looked at the human body and, and, and kind of like teeth the idea of, of uh, defense because we have, like the soldiers that are many doing different uh, jobs in the army, but their overarching goal is to do what? Protect the country, protect this little rock. So they have to gather intelligence. So they go out and they say, uh-huh, this is the strategy, this is the tactics that any opponent will use. Mm-hmm, have it. And they go back to camp and they sort out their ammunition. So if we're ever attacked, yeah, they're ready. Now, our bodies does pretty much the same thing. We have little soldiers running around in the body or white cells. They too have to gather intelligence. And vaccines act as this intelligence. So when we get vaccinated, yeah, the, the little soldiers in our bodies say, mm -hmm, this is how the germs is going to look. Yeah, when it attacks me, this is, and they go back and they make their ammunition. So when COVID or measles or even influenza comes at us, they say, yeah, we're ready. And they're able to prevent us from getting ill. Now, there are several types of vaccines. I mean, it's over 200 years, so we must have plenty. We have those vaccines that are really the weakened versions of the virus, uh, like measles and rubella, yellow fever, chicken pox, which I believe if, if we're all Jamaicans on this platform, we would have received or certainly our measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine already as, as children. We have the inactivated type or the killed virus. So the killed virus is purified and used. And we have polio and influenza being examples. Then, of course, we have our all-time favorite vaccine. Our all-time favorite vaccine is tetanus. Yes, that tetanus shot that we all run to the doctor for when there is the rusty nail that just brush away. You don't even have to joke with proper. The rusty nail just brush away. Mm -hmm. Or the dog bite, not to mention the Sunday morning kitchen cooking and the knife slices. We're all running for the tetanus toxoid vaccine, which helps to prevent lockjaw. Again, because of the wonders of vaccines, most of we, if not all of us on this platform this afternoon, don't even know what lockjaw is. But it was devastating, caused many deaths, and we don't have it thanks to vaccines. Of course, you have some newer ones now, like the, these just use a piece of the virus or a piece of the bacteria, and they make it into the vaccine, like our uh, human papilloma virus vaccine that is given to prevent cervical cancer. Vaccines also have some additives in them. Nothing to worry about. These additives are the same additives that we eat every day in the foods and, and drinks that we have. So we have preservatives, yeah, they prevent contamination once the vial is open. We have stabilizers that prevent chemical reactions from taking place. We have surfactant, another favorite, I tell you, because surfactant is this ingredient that is placed in ice cream mm -hmm. to make it nice and smooth and silky. Yeah, the ones that take us to heaven, you know, that kind of ice cream. Because the products that don't have the surfactant, those are the ones that taste like milk powder, kind of grainy, grainy, you know, we don't buy it. So it's the same uh, additives used in, in foods. Then we have residuals, not active ingredients like egg proteins, yeast, and antibiotics, measured in you know, parts per million, parts per billion, no problem at all. Then this big word, diluent, all it is is water, sterile water. Most of the vaccines come as a powder, and we have to get them injected. So we mix them, and we use sterile water. You also have something called adjuvants. Now, the adjuvants are very important. You know why? Because they help to improve the immune uh, response. So they keep the vaccine at the site and stimulate this local response. We also have some salts, aluminum salts. Again, very, very small quantities. So we know what it is and we know it is good. So 
I have a little uh, film that I'm going to share with us just to look at vaccine development to kind of ease the, the discomfort that some of us are, are continue to have. How do you create a vaccine to fight a new disease? And why does it take so long? Well, first, you have to identify the virus or bacterium that causes the disease. In some cases, the pathogen itself can then be weakened or deactivated and used to make a vaccine. But this isn't always possible. In these cases, the next step is to identify the pathogen's antigens, unique protein or glycoprotein markers which can form the basis of a new vaccine. For some pathogens, these antigens always stay the same. Other pathogens, like the virus that causes flu, can change or mutate their antigens, and so these must be reanalyzed every year. Once you have identified the pathogen or antigens, you need to decide how you are going to use them to build a vaccine. This is called the vaccine platform. There are a lot of options here, like subunit vaccines that only use part of the pathogen. There are also newer or more experimental techniques, like viral vector or nucleic acid-based vaccines. But we'll get to these a bit later. You also need to decide how the vaccine will be administered. By injection into the skin or muscle, orally like the polio vaccine, or through the nose like some flu vaccines. Each of these options could affect the response the vaccine induces. For now, let's say you've decided on the platform and designed the vaccine. Next, it needs to be tested, first in cell cultures and then in animal models. This might include challenge studies, where animals that have been given the vaccine are deliberately exposed to the target disease to see if the vaccine protects them. Further down the line, and if the disease isn't too serious or effective treatments are available, humans might take part in challenge studies too. Once the vaccine candidate is proven safe in animals, you need to prove you can manufacture it to a high enough standard for people and at scale. This is called GMP certification. If the vaccine passes all of these stages, it's time to begin human trials. Normally, these come in three phases and they all have to be passed. First, the vaccine is given to a small group of healthy people to test for adverse reactions. This is called the safety trial. Second, you give the vaccine to hundreds of people to work out what dose is needed to trigger a big enough immune response. Finally, you can trial the vaccine in thousands of people to see how effective it is. This step is often the slowest and participants are sometimes recruited around the world. Researchers have to wait for participants to come into contact with the pathogen naturally. By tracking how many become infected, they can work out how effective the vaccine is at protecting the group. It can take decades to gather enough data to be sure. But if you do, the vaccine can finally be licensed. There are still problems to overcome, however. Mass producing a vaccine to a high standard can be a difficult job. And once you've cracked production, you still have to deliver the vaccine to where it's needed. And then there's phase four monitoring, keeping track of rare adverse reactions that the vaccine might cause even though it's past the previous trials. This trial process is very safe, but that comes at a cost. It is also very slow. In an emergency, there are ways to speed things up like reducing the time spent waiting for paperwork to be completed, or running different trial phases at the same time. But steps are never missed out. By working more efficiently, a protective vaccine could be produced in as little as 12 to 18 months, and advances in biotechnology could speed up production pipelines as well. And there are more ways we could speed up production. Let's come back to some of those newer vaccine platforms. Nucleic acid vaccines don't use pathogens or antigens directly. Instead, they deliver the genetic templates for the antigens. These DNA or RNA templates can be delivered directly or in lipid nanoparticles that help them to enter cells 
and improve their stability after injection. These nanoscale fat droplets encapsulate the RNA or DNA, protecting it as it enters the body. Some lipid nanoparticles can also act as adjuvants, molecular triggers to kickstart the immune response. Once inside the body, these DNA or RNA templates instruct our cells to start making antigens which activate the immune response needed to build immunity. RNA and DNA are much easier and faster to produce in the lab than antigens are. They're also potentially safer than vaccines that contain whole pathogens. That means they could hopefully be used by people with weakened immune systems. But nucleic acid vaccines are still experimental. Another approach is called a viral vector. Viral vector vaccines work by inserting an incomplete segment of genetic material from a pathogen inside a harmless virus that doesn't cause disease. This then acts as a vehicle for the genetic material, delivering it to the right place in the body where it can be translated into proteins, triggering the immune system. The viral vector may even be self-replicating, increasing the amount of vaccine in the body. Viral vector vaccines are also quick to produce. Safe vectors have already been established, and it is relatively easy to insert different target genetic material into these established carriers. And, as the genetic material inserted is incomplete, they can't replicate and cause disease, so they're also very safe. But there is only so much the process can be sped along. Effective vaccines can save millions of lives, but before they are used, they have to be proven to be safe and effective. In the future, researchers hope to develop vaccines against non-infectious diseases, like cancers, based on chemical markers called tumor neoantigens. Vaccine technology is developing every day, and it has a bright future, albeit a slow and methodical one. So, again, we know the benefits of vaccines, and we got a little sneak preview of how they're built. So, you know, the question remains, what is holding us back? And fear is a major factor. Uh, when we all got vaccinated as children, we were just taken to the site and you get your little jab and your ball and that was it. Now we can process things and we we are being bombarded with conspiracy theories and misinformation and all of that continues to drive fear in us and of course prevent us from seeing clearly the benefits of vaccines. There are others of us who have certain religious beliefs that uh, are also inhibiting them from participating in this process of vaccination. Some persons are, you know, being told by their family and friends that, you know, this is not for you. But when you know, say, and they're quiet, the family and friend them don't take a vaccine already, yeah. So we have to be quite mindful of that. Some persons simply don't know why they don't want it, really. Yeah, in no rhyme or reason. And of course, there are others who are so skeptical that they just don't trust the system at all. Something not right, it can't be right. And that's holding us back. So we're going to look at some of the myths now and uh, just counter them with what really are the facts. So we have this myth, and it's more than a myth now. It's, it's almost cemented in, in, in persons' minds that, you know, the vaccine is not safe. It cannot be safe. How can it be safe if you produce it so quick? And me don't know say vaccine takes 10, 15 years to produce. Well, you saw the video, but let's just break it down. There are several things that made it possible for the vaccines to be produced quickly. One, collaboration. You know, together we can. So everybody, all of the scientists then that did have them information that was hoarding it because everybody did want to get a prize at the end of the day that is them create this. Came together and shared information. Can you imagine the wealth of knowledge that came together? And then remember that once upon a time again, each company had to go out and seek funding to 
make whatever product. That never happened because the governments, philanthropists, everybody came together and gave money. So there was global collaboration. There was also the fact that the said scientists that had secrets keeping were working on the coronavirus family of viruses, long time to make a vaccine from MERS and SARS. So they were able to build on that. But the key thing is that the steps have not been skipped. You know, it's the same rigorous procedure that has taken place. I like to look at phase three. Remember, phase three is a phase that takes 10 years and it takes that amount of time because you have to find thousands of people across the world who come naturally in contact with your disease. And that always takes long because we never have known pandemic before. But last year, that 10-year uh, phase could take just about six weeks because the pandemic was everywhere. Everybody was coming in contact with it. And therefore, it was so easy for Pfizer to find 40,000 persons, Moderna, 30,000 persons, AstraZeneca, 40 plus thousand persons, Final uh, Sputnik, 100,000 persons. It was easy. And that phase, that phase alone just cut the duration. So I think we can put that concern best, being mindful that uh, the steps have not been skipped. Now, the next big myth is that COVID-19 vaccine will alter my DNA. So after we take the vaccine, I am going to turn into some other person. I'm going to grow some extra feet and hands, all sorts of things like that. You know, when I started uh, speaking, I had to rely solely on the science, you know, to say that the messenger RNA and the viral vector uh, in, they really just instruct the spike that the cells to produce those germ fighting tools and they don't interfere. But I mean, let's get real. We have over a billion persons that have taken the vaccine. I am sure there are persons on this platform who know somebody that take it. Are they different? Have they changed? Are they now not black and white or Indian because their DNA has been altered? No. So clearly this one is like foolishness and we can put that to rest. Now, the COVID-19 vaccine includes a tracking device. That's another myth, you know, because all of the governments have come together in the world. They're all colluding in some way because they need to know every single time me, Bella, the NS, go to the bathroom and who oh, it's very important. They have to track me. Well, you know, apart from something, and just a little bit over the top, we know that the vaccines, there is no tracking device inside of the vaccine that is going to go into your arm. Really, the vaccines are just there to protect us, help build those antibodies. Now, I believe that this tracking business is a, a product of what we know so well here in country, Chinese telephone. <laughs> People hear about tracking and then them take it to another level by the time it gets to person that different something about tracking. Because in truth and in fact, we do track vaccines. We track protein, we track the manufacturer, batch number, lot track for COVID. We do because vaccines are so delicate. If they are not maintained within a particular temperature range, then they are no good. So from their manufactured until they get into arms, they have to be at a specific temperature. So yes, we monitor for the temperature. I also say that we give healthy people vaccines. So we monitor to see if something went wrong with them. So suppose I take a vaccine and something happens to me and I report it. I go in, I say, boy, I take this vaccine and I have an X, Y, and Z. What we do, we pull the vaccine, the lot number, the batch number, the manufacturer, the clinic that it was given at, the nurse that did give it, the all the other hundred set of people them that get it, and we investigate. Now, if the hundred set of people, 99, because I'm the hundred one, that is sick. If the 99 said, we sick too. Oh my goodness, it's a possibility. Yeah, I will have to report internationally and ask if anybody else in any other country having that same problem. But suppose it's me one and the other 99 people, them are right. Then it's not 
likely that it's the vaccine. So yes, we do track, but we don't need to put anything inside of your arm as a, like a microchip to track vaccines. The other myth is that the vaccines were developed using fetal tissue, and this is a big sticking point with our religious colleagues. Now, let me not belabor this point and just show you. So the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is the one we have in country, it has it uses the viral vector technology. Remember that where you have the shell and they put in piece of the genetic material and it, it's injected into us. Yeah, viral vector. So that's what the first big thing: recombinant, replication, deficient adenovirus vector. That's what that is. Then histidine. That's some proteins in the form of amino acids. We have some salts. We have an emulsifier, some alcohol, some sugar, more salts, and our favorite water for injection. Non dead baby, not in it or parts thereof. Then we have Pfizer. Pfizer might come to Jamaica in short order. So, of course, I have to tell you about Pfizer a little bit. It too don't have known dead baby in it or parts thereof. No human tissue. All right. So, it has fats in it, it has salt in it, it has some sugar, and it has the same modified uh, messenger RNA that codes. For the virus, it don't they don't have the virus in it either. Then we have Johnson Johnson. That's the same technology with the the, the, the the particles and not the virus. Little salt, little more salt, some emulsifier and some alcohol. So that fetal tissue one is another myth that we can dispel. The COVID nineteen vaccine causes infertility in women. You know, I'm going to try to kill off black people. Uh, yeah. So again, when I just started, I had to waste so much on the science, you know, speak to the fact that they, there is no interaction with the sensitive one protein in the placenta and that there is no amino acid sequence that is shared between the spike protein. And then after that, now I started to look at the world that participants that took part in the, in, the, in the clinical trials got pregnant. And then now I stopped using all of that and I just use what I had because we started vaccinating on the 10th of March and uh, there are quite a few of the ladies who were inoculated at that time that are eligible for their second dose that they are coming in. And guess what? Them is pregnant. So, you know, I am looking at what is in front of me, what I'm observing, and I know that the infertility business is not on. This one is that, you know, if I have already been diagnosed with COVID-19, I do not need to get the vaccine. Yeah, because I have my own immunity. I survive. Well, as Elizabeth told us, we still need to get the vaccine. Because guess what? As uh, we, as time passes, natural immunity for this disease means it gets less. Okay, and we would have known persons or heard of persons who had the disease and then get better full hundred. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And then guess what? Them take sick again. Them pop down again. So it is recommended that they get the vaccine, even though they uh, got the illness. So the other myth is that you can get COVID-19 from the vaccine. Yeah, if they take the vaccine, is it the germs that are injecting on me? No, we just showed you the components of the vaccine. It don't have in the virus, it don't have it in weakened, it don't have it in dead, it don't have it in at all. So. Obviously, if it is not made of it, if it is not a part of it, if it is not in it, then it cannot give with the disease. So that, that I mean, really, that one is like a non-starter, really. But look at the other myth. Once I receive the vaccine, I will test positive for COVID-19. We could use the same explanation, but let's look at this one a little uh, closer. Uh, a lot of us, maybe pre-symptomatic or asymptomatic. So we're not showing no sign at all of the disease, but we don't have it in a way already. We have contracted or picked up the virus, but we're asymptomatic. 
So if I have the virus in me and I'm asymptomatic, and then I, I get the vaccine and test, it is a possibility that of course I'm going to test positive. Is that the vaccine given me? Did it done of it already? We also have to look at what is being tested. What tests are we doing? Remember, you have the antigen test, you have the PCR test, and you have the antibody test. Now, when you take the vaccine, we want to build antibodies, the germ fighting tools. So if you do an antibody test, then obviously it's going to be positive. We, we are happy that it's positive indeed. So when we hear this, this talk, we have to be able to look at how indeed we can test positive after we have taken the vaccine, but to be clear that it is not the vaccine that caused us to be positive. Then we have this one, uh, a, a lot of persons are afraid because you know the vaccine has severe side effects such as allergic reaction. Yes, the vaccines can have, uh, or uh, persons can develop a severe reaction. It is very, very uncommon. You know, it's rare. Uh, just like what we have persons who are allergic to shellfish and peanuts and all of those things, it's rare, very few persons. But uh, if they have a severe reaction, we treat them. The very same thing will happen if in the rare occurrence someone gets a severe allergic reaction, then we have the capacity to treat. And if it is so severe and you are getting a two-dose vaccine, we're not going to give you the second dose. The same way as you can't eat shellfish, crayfish, whatever. You're not going to eat it again. Once you experience it once, you're not going to do it again. So that's easy. This one, natural immunity is better. Yeah, you not contaminate the body. Yeah, now put nothing foreign. So it's just natural immunity. Again, natural immunity wanes. But the other more important thing about natural immunity is that you have to get the disease. You have to get sick before you can get natural immunity. And four point how much million people dead already. So you want to take the chance to get it, to develop natural immunity. When you have something that can build immunity without the damaging effects of COVID, remember say, people dead in, you know? People are dead in. They are dying big time from COVID, you might not be fortunate enough to, you know, survive and have your natural immunity. Once I receive the vaccine, I no longer need to wear a mask. What is the point? Do I take a vaccine? Fuck. I still have to wear a mask and physical distance and hand wash. Yes, we do. And that is simply because the vaccines prevent severe illness, hospitalization, and death we can still transmit the virus. So yeah, me vaccinated, me all right, me now go sick, so me can just cough up in your face and talk up to you. But guess what? You have not been vaccinated as yet and you can get sick and die. So wearing the mask, hand wash, hands and um, physical distances is really an act of being selfless so that we can protect others until we get to that point of herd immunity. All right, so the other big thing that is going around is Jamaica take AstraZeneca. Imagine, I couldn't get a better one. Now, the vaccines that have been approved by the World Health Organization are all good. And the vaccines that we must all take is the vaccines that are available. And, you know, just to look at AstraZeneca, it is 79% effective at stopping symptomatic disease. Elizabeth told us of the symptoms, the fact that she was so weak, the fatigue was killing her. She couldn't taste very much, even though the food was served on time. I'm so proud of KPH. Uh, but uh, really, if you can stop the symptoms, you know, you, you can still smell and you can still breathe then what are you complaining about? Look at it, 100% effective against falling ill. Of the persons that were in the study, not one of them, they go to hospital. So AstraZeneca, yeah, it's a good vaccine. Johnson & Johnson is coming. Single dose of Johnson & Johnson, 60, almost 67% effective against the infection, but 76% against the disease after 14 days of you being inoculated. And we up to 85% after 200 days, 280 days, okay? And 
it stop your blood clot. That's that how much time? 93.1%. Good vaccine. I mean, I told you all of them were good, right? <laughs> Pfizer, 95% effective against uh, persons uh, falling ill. So who must get the vaccine now that we have it? They, 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 hopefully, we're going to fly the gate shortly as soon as we get more vaccines in the country. Who is to get it? Well, persons over the age of 18, of course, and for Pfizer, if you're over 12. But hold on, little stuff. We know who COVID-19 affects the worst, don't it? It is the older persons with the comorbid conditions, the sugar, the pressure, the, the asthma, the, you know, uh, the emphysema. It's all of those per persons. So persons with comorbid conditions are targeted. You must come out. So if you're obese, you must take the vaccine. If you have any heart problem, yes, you must take the vaccine. If you have any respiratory disease like the emphysema, the chronic bronchitis, the asthma, yes, you are to take the vaccine. If you have sugar, yes, you are to take the vaccine. If you are HIV or otherwise immunocompromised, yes, you are to take the vaccine. If you have any autoimmune disease like lupus and um, what you call it now, multiple sclerosis and rheumatoid arthritis, yes you are to take the vaccine. If you have been given antibody treatment, and if you recall, last year the university hospital was asking persons who had the illness to come and go get blood and they would use their antibodies to treat persons. All right. So if you got that kind of treatment, you must still get the vaccine. However, you have to wait 90 days after the treatment. Who are we not giving it to? If you have an allergy to any of the components of the vaccine. So if you're allergic to penicillin, you can still get the vaccine because it's a different drug. Don't have any of those components in it. And of course, if you have had an anaphylactic or severe reaction to the first dose, we won't give you the second dose. So now that everybody decides, uh, yes, then we'll take it. What are the side effects? Because like everything in life, there are side effects. Very, very, very common side effects uh, occurring in more than one in 10 persons. Tenderness, pain, warmth, redness, itching, swelling at the injection site. People just feel unwell, they're fatigued, they get chills, they have headaches, some amount of upset stomach, joint and muscle pain. Yeah, expect it. Common up to one in 10 persons, they may get a lump at the injection site. And I beg you, don't to feel up, feel up the side, say it's cold. I mean, just leave it alone. Uh -huh. You may get a fever, vomiting, some flu-like illness, you know, runny nose, sore throat, a cough. And less common, one in a hundred persons may feel dizzy. They have decreased ab appetite, abdominal pain, enlarged lymph nodes, you know, walks and cannot all over the body, excessive sweating, itchy skin, or a rash. Now, all of these side effects are expected in those numbers. But guess what? These last for 24 to 48 hours, and if you're very unfortunate, 72 hours. But in addition to that, there is, there's a good side to this because these side effects are telling us that our bodies have recognized the vaccine the intelligence is being gathered and they are doing the right thing. The bodies are doing the right thing. They are functioning well. So this discomfort that we feel is a good thing. All right. So now let us look at the rare side effects. Rare, rare. When we talk about rare. So AstraZeneca. And a couple of months ago, well, it's months yet. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, this was this big thing about blood clots and, and AstraZeneca. If you take it, you're going to get a blood clot. Yeah. So it is plausible. They have found uh, some increase in, in certain types of, of blood clots. And we have to balance the matter. So we look at the possibility, probability of persons getting a clot after taking the AstraZeneca vaccine. It's one person in every 250,000 persons. So that's four persons in every million. How much million we have in Jamaica? Three. So that's 12 people possibly may get a clot. Uh, yeah. But we have over 1,000 deaths and 51,000 persons um, 
infected. But look at OCP. So the over-the-counter contraceptive kit that the ladies, all of us, take from 18 to 45 have a one in 2,500 chance of us getting a clot. And persons do get clot from time to time, day to day. They looked at baseline rates in the UK that they have 3,000 a month, 10,000 a month in the EU. It, it, it happens and we treat clots. But you're, you, you cannot, for example, stop vaccinating with AstraZeneca because of clots. We can treat and it is very, very rare. All right. So Johnson & Johnson, again, a couple of weeks ago, Guillain Barre was in the news. Of course, Guillain Barre is a kind of neurological disorder. That can lead to death. It, it usually follows viral infection sometimes. But let's look at the cases again. So yes, you have noticed Guillain Barre in, 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 in the population of persons being inoculated. But it's 200 people in 12 million. 800,000. Now, that is, do the math. 0. 0.000, how much zero before you get to a person that will get Guillain Barry. Again, Guillain Barry occurs normally in the population and it can be treated or you can be supported when you get it. Okay, that's so that's Guillain Barry. And then that was, and then you have the messenger RNA one to the like your Pfizer and your Moderna. Again, rare side effect, which is myocarditis. That is just uh, inflammation of the heart and the, 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 the tissues around the heart. And they have found that in young persons who take these vaccines under the age of 30 and men, they can get this thing, uh, myocarditis, pericarditis. They have confirmed about 674 in the billions of people, yes, that have received it and uh, they have not confirmed any death. Well, I didn't see the death the last time I checked, which was last Friday. Uh, these persons are recovering, all right? So those are the rare rituals that can occur with the various types of vaccines. Now, the vaccine facts, we know for sure that the vaccines are safe and effective. We know that the vaccine saves lives. We know that. We know that they will allow us to return to whatever we considered normal a year and a half ago. You know, when we talk vaccines and, and, and COVID, we're always talking medicine, but it's important to talk the economy at times. But the people are suffering, the people don't even know where their next meal are come from. They have no work. They can't hustle. They can't do nothing. And it, it is really having a negative impact on how we live. So people still are watch, wait and see. And we're asking for what, what you're watching, waiting to see. 27.1% of the world population has received at least one dose of the vaccine. And about 14.1% of the world is fully vaccinated. We are far, far from herd immunity. 3.97 billion doses have been administered and 3.97 billion people will get the vaccine. Don't dead. Them don't turn into no other somebody. Them is continuing to have children, etc. Right, 1.1 billion fully vaccinated. Don't they pass up in the race? Of course, we're there. We have vaccinated over 300,000 persons. We have given 178,000 plus first doses and 125,000 plus second doses. So that's the number of persons in country that are fully vaccinated. What is our process? So we have a process. We are offering the vaccines at sites across the island. And you know, sometimes we have mega sites, the blitz operations. We have uh, one, a few, and when I say a few, it's literally a few. One, two, we have drive, drive up facility. So, you know, you can carry your old grandmother and old grandfather. You don't want them to come out of the car uh, in an online. I mean, maybe, maybe they really can't move. So, we facilitate, yeah, you need to find out where we have our drive up, drive through facility. The process, you really just need to make an appointment www.moh.gov.com or 8881 Love. Yeah. Once you've had your appointment date, you walk with your ID or a letter. So it's a government issued ID, of course, or a letter from a justice of the peace, your TRN number. And if you receive the first dose already, then you have to bring an immunization card. Once you come to us, we will welcome you so warmly. You'd never believe it. Uh huh. We register you. We give you some more counseling. You know, because some people still, even though after my done talk, everybody said they're going to take the vaccine. When them go, 
you could call feed, take them and, and put it to wash them. Nurse will be there to counsel you or health educators to just remind you of the benefits and, and, and the risks of taking the vaccine. Then we kind of give you the joke. You know, everybody's calling it jab now, but we didn't know it as joke one time. But you, you're, you'll be inoculated and then you'll be observed so that, you know, we can see if you're having any allergic reaction, anything going on. And then you are free to go with your card. We issue your card. We also advise you that if after you've left the, the area, you notice anything untoward, any reaction that you believe you should not be having, we encourage you to report it. You know, we, you can go back on our website and utilize that reporting form for any adverse event. And we want you to report, but we also want you to tell us. So if you are having an adverse event, please come back to us. Tell us what it is and we will investigate. Remember, we said we investigate. We do a lot number batch. Remember those things and we find other people to see if they're having the same effect. Yes. So, you know, you will so be advised. And ladies and gentlemen, we believe, therefore, that vaccines can put the scale back in the right direction. It will, you know, give us back a little work. We'll be able to go to church. We'll be able to socialize. You know, really, our children will be able to go back to school. We don't want to lose any of our children. You know, we can really celebrate the life of someone. Man, them can go back to a bar and drink a little bit. <laughs> what we call normal. And we believe that vaccines will help us to get there quickly. Thank you very much. I hand over back to our host. Uh, yes, and I will stop sharing my screen. Thank you so much, Dr. Ennis. This was extremely informative and enlightening. And I know that the presentation must have answered a lot of questions that many of us had about the vaccine, about the disease. And I know that there are persons who may be bursting at the seams, nevertheless, with questions. So I will open the floor for questions for Dr. Ennis. I I'm looking at the chat. I know the chat has been doing very well. We've been quite active. Quite a lot of conversations are, have been going on simultaneously. But just to add that Mr. Santoki has provided information in the chat on details of the foundation for those persons who have expressed an interest. And we have a question here. The first question I see here, what about the COVID grant? So I don't know if Dr. Ellis could answer that. So the grant, I believe, is being offered through the Ministry of Finance and the public sector for uh, persons, I believe, over 60 to receive a cash grant. And that's one of the reasons why we ask you to take along your TRN when you're coming, because once you are in our system, the ministry will ask for verification that you indeed receive the vaccine, you're fully vaccinated. And we use, not only, but we use the TRN to assist us in doing so. Uh, so that's why we ask for that uh, card in particular. Okay, thank you. We have another question here. Uh, is there an increased risk of blood clots when on birth control? No. So that has not been shown. They have looked at the persons who have received, who, who have indeed uh, uh, come down with the clots, and it's not so. And even if you have had a clot before, there is no increased risk of taking the vaccine. I'm not hearing you, lady. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> um, we, I was just saying that we also invite questions from our friends in the YouTube chat. So please, through my colleague, Lilika, you could share with us any questions that we may have that Dr. Ennis could answer. Before you do so, we have another question. Could Dr. Ennis speak to how overseas travel can be facilitated 
as many destinations are not accepting our vaccination certificate? So, uh, first of all, countries are sovereign states and therefore they have the right to dictate who and under what circumstances persons can enter into their country. And we don't have any control over that. Now, uh, the vaccines that we have belongs to the AstraZeneca suite, AstraZeneca Oxford, AstraZeneca uh, Serum Institute, Covishield, uh, what we have received through the PAHO from the COVAX facility. Uh, Varivox is one of the other names. And to the best of my knowledge, when I checked, I know it's only Europe that is beginning to process. Uh, the, the ones that they do accept are the ones that we have indeed been given here. So uh, we, we, we should not have a challenge, but be reminded that uh, sovereign states can do as they, they please. So thank you, Dr. Ennis. We have a few raised hands. So we will ask Pertha to allow persons. I see iPhone, that's the name I see in the, in, in the listing. And we also have a raised hand from the Ministry of Culture, Gender and Entertainment and Sports. So could, could you allow them please? We will start with the person listed as iPhone. All right, Dion, that might be me, Herbie. Oh, welcome, Herbie. Okay. Hi, Dr. Ennis. Hi. I have two pages of thing, you know. I'm not <gasps> talking. I just went, I'm just going to run them down quickly. Please. I conclude by saying, though your presentation is enlightening to some of us, it's not sufficiently convincing to the majority of Jamaicans, not just you, the whole, the whole PR campaign, the ministry, the prime minister, the powers that be that addresses the nation regarding this situation. Mm -hmm. It's not getting through to the majority of persons. All right, these are some of the things I run up against. Is this really a vaccination? Many learned scholars, professors, scientists, etc., have made very strong arguments that this is not a vaccination. They define what vaccinations are, etc. Poor little me don't know the difference. All right, I'm not asking you to, let me just run down them quickly. If one can contract COVID after vaccination, why take it? That's a big argument around the, uh, the, 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 the country. Lack of trust in government and administration. How those who are skeptical are treated by government and administration. That's a big thing. We cannot continue to address people and throw them in jail and handle them in a way that um, makes them feel less than we would like to by addressing those questions in the way we seem to be doing. We are a largely uneducated society and we have to find a loving, fatherly, sisterly, brotherly, motherly way to address these folks who believe in the conspiracy business. It is stronger than the conspiracy anti-vax thing is much more convincing and stronger than what we are putting out there. So there's poor PR and educational route reach in my estimation. Confusion of information. For example, the vaccine is unproven in the minds of a lot because it's kind of given a waiver because of the. the, the yeah. yeah. So um, then you talked about Jamaica being among the first to have embraced vaccines over the past 200 years. All that is true. But we were the first to do a lot of other things, theater, um, telecommunications, railroad. Are we therefore the guinea pigs of the world? If it works, fine, but if it doesn't work, we just tried it on some stupid Jamaicans. That's a big question. And another argument out there, 
is that the body is 99% able to fully recover from COVID. So why should an unproven vaccine be put into our bodies? I don't know if that is true. I'm not a scientist. I don't know. But my government and my, my, my health educators aren't giving me a strong enough argument to counter that when I hear people talk like that and watch them on TV and wherever I see them. Um, so prominent, I said that already, the scientists. Were all these vaccinations really put through all the three stages that you spoke about? Um, how about those who have taken it and still claim that they get COVID? I go to um, the fear about taking this thing, the skepticism, the conspiracy theories. But if we have scientists and so on collaborating to make it happen, we also have, I have noticed, big shot lawyers, scientists, etc., coming together, some 2,000 of them, to bring a class action suit against this whole idea that there is a COVID thing. First, lastly, I would suggest that the government use believable personalities, people who the common man and woman in the street relate to. Oliver, for example, Taurus Riley, as if they even believe that this thing ought to be properly put to people to convince them. But we use personalities who are believable and in their own creative way can communicate with the masses, have more town hall meetings. I don't know government and health, health ministry in particular are going to the people and just sitting and reasoning with them on the corner and round up rather than just lock down the dance and lock down the things that they keep. Because these people are telling me, them not seeing no COVID enough for them here. Them not seeing nobody dying from it in the bars and in the things they keep around their communities. So I do not think we are doing a good job. Accessibility is different. I tried from May to get it. I'm 73. From May, I've been trying to get it. It's yesterday I get one. Yesterday, you go to, to the place, it's confusion. There's no vaccine here. You get an appointment, nobody turn up to administer it and stuff like that. So there's confusion at the side, difficulty making the appointments, accessibility is poor, and the community person, the lay persons have their own ideas of why they are being targeted. And as one man said to me, this is not a pandemic. This is a mandemic. In the long run, I take mine and I try and convince people and I cut off those who make too big an argument that they're not taking it and the rest of we shouldn't. Thank you for listening to my chatting. Thank you very much, sir. I, I, I believe that... There are others on the platform who may have a different experience, uh, but your concerns are, have been heard. I will make an attempt to answer uh, in the best way I can, being very, mindful that, them, you know that. being very mindful that I am not a politician. I'm a technocrat. Right. I am a technical person. A lot of your issues seem to be bordering on Political uh, and social, uh, and and social. But I I I must say that there there are a few medical things I can extract from what you said. Persons getting COVID after the vaccine, the vaccine were never ever posited as something that will prevent you from contracting the disease. They were developed to prevent severe illness, prevent hospitalization, and to prevent death from COVID. So there is no confusion there. There, was, there is no lie there. That is what they were developed for. It is now just that they have begun to look at infectivity and look at, look at the burden of the disease after you have been vaccinated. Those studies are now being conducted, looking at the burden. So if I take the vaccine, what is the 
amount of virus in my respiratory tract, in my nose and mouth, that uh, can I still uh, transmit the disease? And those studies are looking very positive, especially for AstraZeneca, where the disease burden seems to be less. So again, the vaccines did not propose to say that if you take it, you won't get the disease. Uh, it says you won't get severely ill, you won't be hospitalized, and you won't die. So yes, you can still get the illness after you have been vaccinated. There is no vaccine, those created before or now, that is 100%. So there are a small percentage of persons that will get any disease that they take a vaccine from for. So that's not anything new or anything unique. I mean, nothing is 100%. So you have 95%, there's still a 5%. And if you look at the whole world, how many persons make up that 5%? Now, just, just allow me to say something very quickly. While what you just said is understandable to those of us listening to you right now, and many of us in Jamaica, the masses don't understand that. If there's a vaccine, it should prevent it. That's their way of seeing and understanding. You and I and my colleagues here understood what you just said. And among our colleagues and friends and associates, most of us, if not already vaccinated, are willing to be vaccinated. But the masses don't see what you just said as sensible to them. If I take it, I shouldn't get it. You know, That's what I, 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 it should prevent. I, I, I hear, I hear the talk that you and I and my colleague here understood what you just said. And, and I I'm hear the talk that friends and Jamaicans most are of us, most of us, if not already vaccinated. Why is that still playing? Willing to be vaccinated, but the masses don't see what you just said as. But sir, it has, no, that, it, that it has to be second. said. No, no, but you technical, see, no, no, bear with me. There's a technical issue just now. I am quiet, but I heard myself repeating what I said earlier. So that wasn't me interrupting it. That was a technical issue, it seemed. Okay. Yeah. Well, un understood. You know, I, I, I hear it being said that, you know, Jamaicans are, 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 I guess it's not as educated, but I, 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 I want to not accept that because Jamaicans are smart. Jamaicans do understand. I would never believe that my people don't understand. They understand. Uh, yeah. They do. Think they just need That's to be. Why two thousand of them turn up to a party? you know, being indisciplined and lacking in understanding in my mind are two clearly different things because Nothing those same, no, 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 sir. Those same 2,000 persons, those same 2,000 Jamaicans that turned up to a party in Jamaica, you send them go foreign and tell them no party and all of them turn on them yard, them not left, okay? This our same Jamaicans who come to work in Jamaica late, you send me to come away at 10 o'clock. You send me to work for it and meet up work from 7 to 30 when the shift starts at 10 o'clock. So I don't buy the foolishness that Jamaicans don't understand or they're not educated. No, no, no. We are in discipline. And whenever we choose to obey, we can. I have, I mean, that, that's my take on it. I am not going to excuse Jamaicans and say, that no, they're not understanding and you're there. No, no, no. Because we understand when we want and when we're when we are placed in other situations, we behave properly. Now you spoke to the I, I like the guinea pig one that you said. And I, I I also want to just really wonder if we could think that way. We are leaders. Jamaicans are leaders everywhere in the world we go. We take first mover advantage. And to think that we could even be likened as, you know, we are guinea pigs of the world. I, 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 I want to personally dismiss that one because I am a leader. We've 
got to step out and do what we know is right. And I, I, I would never ever consider myself as a, a guinea pig, something being tried on me. Uh, the claim we're, we're gets talking about it. ourselves and our colleagues here, we're talking about the masses who feel as if they're just being used as guinea pigs. That's what I'm picking up out there. So well, I, don't know, I don't know if other persons I don't know if other persons on the platform may want to agree or to counter you. I don't know. I I I if 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 that's what you're hearing, if that's what you're feeling, if that's what the pulse is, then it, it might be so. That's not necessarily what we're getting. Uh, I do agree that uh, common persons, the common man, it, it's, it's a one-on-one. -on -one. We have started our program and our program was inviting persons to come in to take the vaccine. Everything happens in stages. Everything happens in stages. So we were at the first stage where we would invite persons to come into our health centers, to come into you know, our specialized sites for vaccination. But we do understand the business of accessibility. We do understand that once we get more vaccines in country, then we will need to take the vaccines to persons, okay? So we will be going into the communities. We will partner with SBC. We will look at the faith-based organizations, but everything takes time. It's a process. And it is dependent on the numbers of vaccines. So the point of so the Thanks for a spirited discussion there. Oh. Uh, we have we oh, have a few more questions that we want to take. Dr. Ennis, you want to take a breath or two? <laughs> oi, oi, oi. <laughs> um, okay, so we have someone from the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment and Sport who has who has had his hand up for quite some time. Could you go ahead, please? Oh, you know, is that his? I, I, was, I was told in the background, sir. <laughs> Brown. Hi, Dan, how are you? Hi, Doc, how are you? Hey, I'm good. Doc, let me be very brief. Um, before COVID, the first case was announced in March, in February, um, 2020? Mm. Okay. February, March. Right. I had come back from a trip from Paris. When I came back, and long after the conversations went in, um, I suspected that I was probably patient, what do you call it, one or patient zero. <laughs> the index. All the signs when I was okay. away in Paris. The shortness okay. of breath, the diarrhea, the chest pains, the cough, mm -hmm. um, the loss of smell. I've never had that before in my life. Mm -hmm. um, but at the time, testing answer wasn't even out here. So I just thought it was a... Uh, a funny, what they call European cold, you know, when you go travel. Mm -hmm, I came mm -hmm. back. Um, subsequent to that, a uh, couple months now in September last year, mm -hmm. um, I did contract COVID and I did test positive. My, I suspect, however, that I would either have had two cases or one and a half. <laughs> My question to that is this then. If it is that you have had COVID for more than one occasion, how does the vac how ben beneficial is the vaccine to you? Or, or do you know of any other cases like that um, out here in Jamaica? Well, there are persons I, I have heard about here in country like you. The challenge is also like you. They didn't get tested on the first time. So it was just, you know, you look like a duck, you walk like a duck. So you are a duck. That's basically it. And they would have tested the second time. And... Uh, or vice versa, they tested the first time and because it smelled the same way the second time, they didn't bother to get tested. But the point really is that the natural immunity continues to wane. And the advice so far, the science so far, is still saying that you should get vaccinated. And if you're getting vaccinated with a two-dose vaccine, you should take both doses. So that is the recommendation still. Okay. Um, in my case, I'm thinking about the J and J. So should I go ahead with it? You should go ahead with whatever vaccine is available. Yes. All should. right. Thank you, Doc. You're welcome. All right. Great. Thank you, David. Dr. Ennis, I'm not sure how much more time you have to hang out with us, but we have one or two more questions that we want to field. 
Uh, is it okay for us to go ahead? Okay, great. We have one question coming from our YouTube channel. I'll ask Lelika to share that with us. Okay, good afternoon, colleagues. So from the YouTube channel, somebody was asking, why is it that the government will open up, uh, make the vaccine available for persons who are willing to take it, but in your presentation, you had said that sooner or later, it will go down to the 18 year old and over. But I mean, persons are willing to take the vaccine for a longer period of time, but they do not fall into the category for those who are supposed to take, get the vaccine. So why the government don't just make from your willing to take the vaccine, why not just give to, to, to those persons? And a, another person was really commenting on your presentation that she's saying uh, she already take the vaccine and she wished many would change their attitude, or attitude towards the vaccine because um, her cousin who is a policeman did not take the vaccine and he died from COVID-19. So um, she's just encouraging persons to go ahead and take the vaccine. All right, thank you. Thank you so very much. And uh, Herbie, we are getting the testimonials and I, I, I can only hope that persons are talking one-on-one, -on -one, talking in their church groups uh, mm -hmm. on Zoom, that you know they have taken the vaccine and they're okay. Uh, with regards to opening up, you know, the administration of the vaccines uh, is, 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 uh, has to be aligned with international best practice. And across the world, the first set of persons to be vaccinated are persons who are most vulnerable. It is the healthcare workers, the non-health frontline workers, it is the elderly, and that is happening across the world. Persons are getting to younger ages now because they are at 40, 50, 60% of their population inoculated, which would have taken care of those persons. So we are doing what we should do, what is absolutely correct. And the small amount of vaccines we have received, 300 and 14,000 doses that we have received, we really couldn't open it up to the average Jamaica because it is still the most vulnerable persons that are dying if our healthcare workers are not vaccinated and there is no health system, then that's chaos in the country. So as we get more vaccines in the country, we will be able to open it up to other persons because ultimately, we want to get to herd immunity, which is 70% of our, uh, of our uh, population. Okay, so uh, moving, moving along quickly, we have another question from Lorian Harris, who's asking, Dr. Ennis, could you touch on perhaps how this idea of being anti-vaxxers in Jamaica matches up with childhood vaccinations and how we as a people receive that existing program? Well, recall that the anti-vaxxers are not just for <laughs> COVID, it's for all vaccines. And uh, a part of the possible reason why we have anti-vaxxers is because vaccines have worked so well. And there is two or three generations of persons who don't know the illnesses that we're speaking about. And interestingly, the anti-vaxxers have all been vaccinated. <laughs> they understand they are old people. Well, let me not say old people. They are persons, you know, range, they have young ones, but they are persons ranging up to 60s, 70s that are anti-vaxxers who have all been vaccinated. But if you don't know of a disease, for example, if you don't know of a disease, you have never seen it, you don't know what it can do, you're going to say, I'm going to give my child this vaccine for something I don't know, something that maybe the people they might imagine, you know, uh, and it's, it's, they are resistant. We have seen that persons, especially, 
especially adults, don't warm up to vaccines. So the same healthcare worker in Jamaica who we offer the flu vaccine every year. We offer the flu vaccine because healthcare workers should get it. Them not take it. I'm not taking it, but them go to America, go work. And them can't get to work in no hospital over there unless them take the joke, the, the flu vaccine, and they all take it. You know, so <laughs> you asked about the impact, the anti-vaxxers, they are having an impact. But again, circumstances and location kind of dictate how persons behave. And, and Master Herbie, you're going to have yes, to help. Ma'am. You're going to have to help me with how to, to get people to behave. The same way all them behave are firing is the same way they must behave here at Yard. That's That's them, get, them make more money of firing. That's why them told the line. Oh, okay, so. <laughs> I hear no, you. No, call them whenever you want that. Please. All right. Thank you, Herbie. Thanks, Doc. Next question from what I've heard and read, and this is from C. Dillard. Okay. From, what I've, from what I've heard and read, ivermectin was cheap with few side effects. It was seen to be effective against COVID around the world. A meta-analysis, that is to say a combination of many studies done, showed it to be very effective. Doctors of conscience were begging for it to be used. I wonder why it was neglected for the vaccine. That's the question. So that, that's, that's two different things. Mm -hmm. The ivermectin is used to treat severe disease. The vaccines prevent severe disease. That's two different things. And they shouldn't be compared. So if you get sick and uh, you're dying, you may be offered ivermectin to try and save your life. The vaccine is to prevent you from getting to that point. So uh, you could say that both medications have a place. You know, we diet and we exercise and we, eat, we, we get good sleep because we don't want to get sugar. We don't want to get pressure. But when we get them, we have to take medication. So, you know, you can't compare both. You can't say negate prevention at all and just go to the medicine or vice versa. They complement each other. Okay. Thank you, Dr. But I just, I just Sorry, saw Herbie. a paper where it is being um, distributed for administering to COVID, uh, if not patients, to certainly be a part of the vaccines that are available. I think it's Sunday's paper I read that in. But it's not a vaccine. Ivermectin is not a vaccine. Uh, it's used to treat. It is not a public health strategy for the control of COVID. It's not a public health strategy. It's used by clinicians on an individual basis uh, 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 for patients who they have seen and believe it will be of benefit to them. So we have to get that distinction clear. It is not a public health. It is not being used wide scale across the world. So everybody going to get ivermectin tablets. Okay, it's it's a but different. Thing. Those doctors who are advocating that direction, not understanding what you just explained. You uh, so there are specialists in their own right. Now, if you are an internist or you know whatever your specialty is and you are treating one patient, then that's your focus. If you are a public health specialist, you are treating for the greater good. There, there are two different things. So a, a orthopedic doctor and a, 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 a chest doctor are two different doctors. They are doctors, but they are specializing in different things. And public health is its specialty in its own right. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next question from Leonard Wright. Before we have a question in the chat here from Leonard Wright. Why are there some, why are some vaccines two doses while some are one? Second part of the question, is it a matter of dosage or strength of the vaccine? It is a matter of the platform that is used uh, to develop the, the, the vaccine and the efficacy that they have found. That's so right. uh, most vaccines are not single dose vaccines at all. Outside of maybe BCG that you get at birth, 
most vaccines uh, are multiple doses and even have booster doses because they look at how the immune system functions. We do appreciate those that are single dose and offer lifelong immunity, but artificial uh, uh, immunity can also win. And uh, it has been found that in some cases, when you give a second shot, it kicks the memory cells in and uh, uh, provide that high immunogenicity. Okay, thank you. Uh, Okima has her hand up, Okima. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, just a brief question. Um, of the double dose vaccines expected on the island, will they be administered? Um, will, well, will each person be reserved or guaranteed two shots? Um, no, or will they get the single shots and then we wait on another shipment of supplies? I only ask because uh, we, I realize that we almost run into issues with second shots for some of the persons who got their first job and weren't um, you know, fully vaccinated. So are we going to depend on um, these sets or are we going to vaccinate with all that we have now and then wait until another shipment to administer second jobs? Well, all of those, it, it depends. The answer is really that it depends and multiple factors go into making that decision. So when we would have received our doses earlier this year, it, it, it was very dependent on the expiration date. We could not wait eight to 12 weeks to give the second shot because the vaccines would be no good. They would have expired. So, you know, lots of things come into play into making that decision. And we do look at the promises, the commitments for future shipments, the timelines for same, you know, being mindful of, 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 of any shortfall that may take place. So it's several things that go into play, uh, into play to make that decision. So I really can't say, you know, to tell you how we're going to be managing it. But whatever we do, if once we're offering two doses, then we will be able to give persons their second dose. Okay, thank you. I noticed that there are some persons who have, who have asked already who may be asking more questions. But just let me just give some other persons a chance of, who haven't had the opportunity to ask. We have a question from Tisha. I've already had COVID-19 and recovered. Do I still need to get vaccinated with a COVID-19 vaccine? And this is being asked on behalf of someone. Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Please do get vaccinated. All right. And the second, is it safe for a child to take the vaccine? The vaccine is not being offered to persons below the age of 18. The only vaccine that uh, can be given below that age at this time is Pfizer, and we don't have Pfizer in Jamaica as yet. Okay, so next question, how long does protection from the COVID vaccine last? And we don't know. We don't know. Uh, studies have started. It's looking as if, looking, it's a possibility, all of those you know, tentative words that the vaccine may need to be given on an annual basis, like how we give the flu vaccine. Uh, and again, because of the multiple variants, it may be that a, 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 a shot has to be given every year. And we would have heard Pfizer trying to push out their head, talking about booster shots and then uh, yearly shots. So we don't know, but it, the, the science continues. All right. Uh, we have one person asking, this is a question for us. Uh, will the YouTube link be accessible after the end of the session? It most certainly will. It is being recorded. And I note that the time is 2 p.m. Uh, I will take one last question and that will go to Mr. Santoki, who is asking, <laughs> Do we have vaccines here now for anyone to take? And if so, where can we get it? So we have vaccines at this time. We have been focusing uh, 
even today on giving the second dose, the vaccine are available at our health centers. We have an online system of making an appointment, uh, www.moh.gov.jm, or you can call your nearest health center. You can also call our uh, 8881LOVE number to get the sites that are open. In Kingston, we have the Good Samaritan Inn, we have St. Joseph's Hospital, we have Mona Aging and Wellness Center, we have University Hospital. In St. Thomas, we have Moran Bay uh, uh, Health Center, which is on the Princess Margaret's compound. We have Black River Health Center, Lionel Town. It's all over the country. You just need to make an appointment. I was most distressed when Herbie said that there was confusion and he only received his dose at his age last week. Very disappointed. Uh, I have, on the other hand, heard good news about this thing. I even saw in the chat person for saying that there is no confusion, but there's always room for improvement. Uh, we ask that persons make their appointment uh, for the vaccine. Now, as soon as we get vaccines in country and an announcement was made that we should be getting uh, on Friday, it means that we will be able to resume offering first dose of the vaccine. Okay, I hope that answers your second question, Mr. Santoki, about not so just not just the second dose and not the first. I think uh, Dr. Ennis's last comment may have answered that. Uh, another question, which of the vaccines is available? And I will take that as a last question for the afternoon because we have to uh, respect that Dr. Ennis also has other engagements, I'm sure. And many of us have other activities to, to, to attend to. So last question, Dr. Ennis, which of the vaccines is available? That's your last question. AstraZeneca. AstraZeneca. Yes. All right. So we, we want to do a very quick poll following this spirited discussion. And we're going to do that now ahead of Mrs. Tracy Comock, who's going to thank everyone for attending. So we're going to quickly put up a poll, a very quick one for everyone, and we will see. But I will also add, while we're doing that, Lilika actually did, a, did a, the same poll on the YouTube mm -hmm. platform, and 44% said they had already taken it. 33% oh. said maybe. 22% said yes, and zero said no. So I think that was, that's quite good. That's, that's some, some good uh, data there. Uh, and we will certainly share that with you, Dr. Ennis, if you, if you want it. Most um, definitely, thank you. Uh, are we going to do the second poll very quickly? Because I know persons have to run off to, to do their other duties. So yes, here we go, very quickly, everyone. Very, very quickly. Let's run our second poll. Uh, yes, Emma, I, I, I note your comments in the chat and I said it at the beginning. I guess I should have said it in the middle and I'll say it now before before uh, Dion runs me off. No, no, not at all, <laughs> not at all, Doc. <laughs> the benefits of sunlight, benefits of sleep, the benefits of, of eating properly, the benefits, uh, you know, it it's, cannot be overemphasized. And you are correct about the air, the AC. We don't want the AC at this time, the fresh air. You know, if you have to be in a crowd, it has I'm got just... to be outside. You've got to have that 10, 20 persons outside, not in any closed space, because we want that the air to be flowing. Thank you. We've been also getting some, some feedback from Petra. This was a great session, well organized and presented. Thanks for the invitation. Kareen, very informative. Really appreciate this presentation. All of that is for you, Doc. So we're preaching to the converted. Oh, here we have the results. 7% uh, said no. So the percentage has gone down in terms of those who have not. 40% said yes, a slightly lower percentage of persons said they're not sure, that's 33%, and 20% are already vaccinated. 
So I do believe that this session certainly has been of, of extreme value to many persons who have not been getting much information out there. So Jacques, thank you so much. Very good discussion. Sure, very very good discussion. You can pick some for me. LHMJ. Right. And we're going to mute Herbie. Uh, appreciate, appreciate everything Doc said. Let us share with others. Great presentation. And thank you all for hosting this. We need to hear more from the other side, though, don't you think? All right, appreciate that, C. Dillard. And Tracy, Tracy is going to give the thank you to all of us. And I just want to say my own thanks, special thanks to Dr. Ennis for agreeing to come at such short notice. And I really do appreciate what was all of what was done today. Thanks to my colleagues and Tracy. I open the floor to you as we start our closing out. Thank you, Dion. Um, afternoon all, and, and Dion almost did all of the thanks. So there's very little for me to say, but I'd like to really, Dr. Ennis, I haven't met you yet, but you were well introduced to us because Professor Young is our chairman of the Natural History Advisory Board, our board of management, and he would have liked to be here. So to do this, to do this vote of thanks, but on, He's unavoidably absent, so let me just say thank you. I really appreciate the time taken to share with us this afternoon. Your presentation was also um, enlightening and clear. I really like the, the, the fact that you went into the myths. Um, and I'm sure persons can come out of here thinking today that yes, a lot more has been clear, clearly presented to us. Um, Elizabeth, thank you for sharing your experience. And Liz, oh God, is a dear friend. We're so happy that she's still with us after going through that. Sorry that Mr. Santoki didn't get to present his experiences, but we have him sharing his information on his foundation and we will definitely follow up with you on that. The audience, let me thank you for share, staying with us. It's over two hours and you can tell this was a very good presentation, very good live discussion. So people have stayed with us. And we thank you for that. It's very warming to see. Um, I mean, I have relatives and friends on, and I have um, we have persons who worked with us on IOJ long ago, Margaret and Celeste, um, colleagues from UDC and NEPA, and of course our parent ministry. We're very, very grateful that the Ministry of Culture, Gender, Entertainment, and Sport is here with us to just see, you know, some of what we do. Um, the IOJ family, Mr. Crawford brought the welcome in his usual style, and we appreciate that. Mr. Crawford uh, supports our, our work in natural history. And our colleagues, we have our colleagues from um, the council, the boards of management. Emma is on our board. Thank you, Emma. We have other heads of division here with us. You heard from Herbie. And Herbie, we're going to do a presentation using music, all right? We'll work with you with that. Um, we have, as I said, past members of staff and um, other persons in the IOJ who have helped us put this together. You know, the PR department, IT, really, really appreciate it. Now I have to big up my family, the NHMJ family, for all the support. Now Dion, Dion and the team in zoology, this was their idea. And Dion is extremely passionate about, you know, what happened to Liz and other members of staff and family and just how we're reacting to the whole issue of COVID. So, we have to big up natural history, big up the zoology department. Thank you, Dion. Thank you for inviting your friends and your family. Um, the education department, the leaker up there in the, in the science library, all of natural history has come together. And we've even not been able to use our lecture hall today, but people have helped us. We have persons in our library. We have persons in the council chamber. So the museum um, people, we have a natural history museum here in Jamaica. And our museum, yes, we display and we preserve the artifacts, the, the specimens in the collection. But as a museum, it is our role to, you know, to educate people, to inform them on potential public issues and science and environmental issues. And that's what we're doing today. So this is at the end of it. We're not open to the public right now, but we're definitely still alive. We still want to play a significant role and we're doing that. So we really, really thank you all for joining us today. And we will keep you informed on other activities that we're doing. All right. So thanks again, Dion. Thanks, team. Thanks, audience. Thank you so much, Dr. Ennis, for your clear presentation and, and for you know, the lively debate. 
Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was really my pleasure being here. I am grateful and I wish for all to stay safe. Let us continue to do what's right and spread the word. Thanks so much. And Thank Tracy, you. you need to tell me where I know you're from. I, you need to tell me where I know you're from. I'm looking at the face and I know I know you. I don't know if it's... You're, you're, you're muted. <laughs> you're muted, Tracy. Sorry, thank you. Dr. Innes, I was telling you earlier to turn on your camera. So I don't, I don't know. I, 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 I know, know, I know you. I don't know if I know you're from Harborview. Okay. If I know you're from UE Zoology. If okay. I know you're from... I did botany there. I did botany, but I have a lot of zoology spread. Botany, yeah, yeah. I know you're from somewhere. And I'm like, where <laughs> I know this girl from? <laughs> No worries, we'll, we'll have more of these discussions and I'm looking forward to meeting you. And as I said, Prof Young, really sorry he's not here, but he did big you up too. So thank okay. you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Oh, sorry, Dr. Ennis, very quick yeah. question. There are some persons who didn't get an opportunity to ask questions in, yes. the, in the session. Okay. So would you be able to, if we, if we send you via email, would you be I able to? I should be able to answer. Oh, I okay. should, I should, I should All be right. able. All right, let me have a quick, let me, let me just share a quick one. And, and, I, and I'm doing so because, sorry, no, 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 Tracy, it was very quick, but um, because I feel so guilty that I didn't spend more time with our YouTubers. But oh. somebody was asking, why is it that persons who are vaccinated against polio and MMR, MMR are immune for years, but there is an argument about the need for a booster for COVID-19 after a much shorter time? Different organisms. And remember, for polio, you would have got five shots. <laughs> you would have started getting your five shots. You're not getting it. You started getting at at six weeks, then you got three months, true, and you true. got twelve or to eighteen months, and you got that four is, to six. So it's whole heap of shots we get till we. That is true. Step, you know, so it it really isn't strange to be saying you know another shot. Okay. Thank you so much. That was our last YouTube question. So I bid you goodbye, everyone, and see you again soon. Have a great afternoon. Dr. Ennis, have a wonderful afternoon, and we will keep in touch. Thank you. Thank you. Stay thank safe, you. everybody. Thank you.
Liz, thanks for calling you. Thank you. <laughs> thanks, Tracy.